I'm going to cry. These SSDs are so slow. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna cry. I have red eyes, irritated, that's just eye drops. I'm going to uh, try and make this M2 Mac Mini faster. This is the base model, yes, it has the 256 chip in it, the one NAND chip, and if we run the test, you know, we get the speeds, they're not so impressive compared to the new models, but they're, they're still very good. So why is this bad and how is it going to negatively impact your work? Well, maybe it won't. We're gonna take a look at an example of that today, as well as where the problem actually happens and how you can possibly go around the problem. So here I've got a little setup. We've got the Mac Mini, we've got an OWC Thunderbolt 4 dock. I've used it for a lot of things. It's really nice, it's small. I'll link to it down below. And the reason I'm using that dock is because this Mac Mini only has two Thunderbolt outputs and I need more than that for what I'm doing here. And you actually might run into this limitation yourself if you end up getting this machine. So that's a nice little piece of hardware to add as an additional thing later on down the line when you decide you'll need that. Now, one of the problems you might run into is copying files. And I've downloaded this file here. It's the Ubuntu ISO and it's 3.83 gigabytes, just to give you an idea of uh, a pretty decently sized file. I'm going to copy this file and show you how long it takes. I'm gonna use this time command and uh, the copy command. And I'm gonna time the copy command. And I also need to use the sync command here to do a flush at the end. And then I'm gonna spit out the total time that it takes, as well as the individual times for that, for each one of those operations. First, I'm going to copy this file from the desktop to the documents folder on the internal SSD. I'm doing this a couple of times just to get sort of an idea of an average here. I've got, uh, let's see, 5.1, 7.6, 7.1, one more time, 5.3. Okay, so that's how long it takes. Now, I've got another drive here, and this is actually a, uh, a Samsung 970. I did actually uh, put a Samsung 990 Pro in this enclosure, but because we're hooking up to Thunderbolt 4 here, we're going to be limited to a certain cap of uh, maximum read and write speeds. So I decided to save some money, skip the 990, skip the 980, and went for the 970, which can handle these speeds just fine. And the enclosure I'm using here is the Arico M.2 SSD enclosure that's compatible with 40 gigabyte speeds. So it is uh, a Thunderbolt 4 enclosure. And this is what that box looks like in case you're curious in picking one up. Let's transfer the file to that enclosure instead. I have it mounted over here under volumes, Sam for Samsung users, Alex documents. Let's go. 1.4, let's do that again. 1.4, 1.4, and 1.4. This is a three gigabyte file that's being transferred at 1.4 seconds. Now, if we run the disk speed test and we select that drive, look at the speeds we're getting here now. 2700 on write, 2700 on read. And these are the same kind of speeds I get on my M2 MacBook Air, as long as it has more than 512 gigs or more than 256 gigs of storage, because then we're going to the two NAND chip configuration, which are faster. Now it's not faster than the most recent M2 Pro and M2 Max machines, which have really gotten a nice boost if you go with a terabyte model and up. Those go up to five, six, and even I've seen it hit 7,000 um, megabytes per second. We don't really need those kinds of speeds. As you can see, a three and a half gigabyte file was transferred in just over a second. So that's, that's pretty good. This is going to be the biggest bottleneck for you if you're getting this machine is transferring large files because if you're doing any kind of compilations, that's not gonna harm you at all. In fact, I'm about to show you. I'm gonna run the Xcode benchmark as we uh, sometimes do here. It's a pretty good project. I'll link to it down below. And to run it, we just execute shell command benchmark.sh and off it goes. Now this is running on the local SSD that's inside the Mac mini. Separately, I'm doing tests on the MacBook Pros with the M1 Max, comparing that to the M2 Pro and the M2 Max. So find those videos. I'll link to those down below or they'll be on the channel. I'm doing a bunch of tests on mobile development, game development, uh, machine learning and and so on. All right, so we've got a time of 107, 107 seconds to build on this machine. Now let's do the build on the external drive and see how that does. Folks, 
it's done. And we got the exact same score. Well, almost the exact same time, 107.5 seconds. So this essentially gives us the ability to be able to expand our Mac mini storage with a faster drive. That's not the only thing you can do. You can actually install Mac OS on the external drive. Now there's different ways of setting this up depending on what operating system, what Mac OS you're running on. Ventura is what I have here. I would just hold down the power button for a while and this is gonna start up the Mac in recovery mode. Here you're gonna have options. You can boot from these drives, but if you didn't set one up yet, you can go to options here and go through the process of setting it up. Make sure you erase the new drive and format it as APFS, and then you can install Mac OS on it. I've rebooted and now I'm just using my Mac mini and pretending that nothing happened. Uh, like I didn't buy a 256 gigabyte model. No, I bought a one terabyte model. Check it out. I'm going to open up Blackmagic speed test and start my test and look at my speed. I have 2700 and no, this is not me selecting the external drive. This is by default now my drive. If I go to my root directory in the root directory, I can go to my folder here and my benchmarks and I have all all my tests that I had on my external drive. This is the external drive, but it's acting like the system drive. If we go to settings and then storage, look at that. I have one terabyte available and I only used 197 gigabytes. Now, if I got the 256 gigabyte drive, I'd be almost out of space after installing all my programs on it. I was about to publish this video when I thought I didn't talk about the most important thing, which is swap. A lot of you are going to be worried about that. When you've run out of RAM, the operating system is going to start writing to disk, but it's not really that simple. There's also cache. Things that are actively being used are not going to be written to swap. Those are the things that are going to be kept in memory by the operating system. They're going to be kept in RAM. Virtual memory uses RAM as cache for larger address space. So as long as you hit rate as high, swap being slow isn't that much of a problem. What I can do is simulate my typical workday on this Mac mini. I've started with the internal SSD as my system drive so that it will be used for swap. And I recreated what my typical working desktop looks like. I've got 15 Chrome tabs open, Xcode, iOS simulator, a couple of instances of VS Code, and some utility apps like Notion, Todoist. The swap started being used quite a bit and went over a gigabyte, but system usability didn't suffer at all. I ran Xcode benchmark again with a loaded system and found that while the benchmark ran a bit slower, it wasn't terrible. I landed at 116 seconds. Now, I was also curious to see how a large JavaScript monorepo build will do here. So I ran this build. It's a monorepo that has 27,000 components total. So a lot of really small files. And this build uses many parallel node processes, but it also relies on single core operations for each build. The build took just over five minutes and resulted in quite a bit more memory pressure and about 2.3 gigabytes of swap being used. The memory pressure being in the green means OS is managing to hold things steady, resulting in perfectly fine usability of the system. So I was pretty happy with that. And at this point, I was pretty sure that all was well and that we'd get the same or better results when making use of the external drive, which is faster as our system drive. I was wrong. At first, I noticed a slowdown in our Xcode benchmark, which resulted in 127 seconds second build time. This was with over five gigabytes of swap being used at the time by the OS. And I thought maybe things need a bit of time to calm down. So I waited a little bit and then ran the benchmark again, resulting in 122 seconds, still slower than on the internal drive. When I ran the large JavaScript monorepo build, that's when the shit really hit the fan and I've discovered the worst case scenario. Now, even though the memory pressure was starting to hit the red and it was using almost nine gigabytes of swap, I I didn't initially notice a problem with usability. However, I did end up with a much slower build time of seven minutes and 13 seconds. So again, I was optimistic and I ran the test one more time and that's when I saw it. Here's a clip of my testing uh, and my disappointment. This machine has become unusable. I'm, uh, I'm randomly clicking on buttons that I didn't mean to click on because my mouse froze and I was going somewhere else. Look at this 11 gigabytes of swapping used here and everything is in the red. Yeah. And this build is taking a long time to do. I think it's stuck. Now we've got a problem. Navigating between files is nearly impossible. Um, <laughs> I thought we'd be able to get away with this, but I'm glad I stuck it out and did this test because 
Whoa. Yeah, so finally I closed all the running programs and saw the memory pressure drop to green and the system became responsive again. Ah, everything was fine in the world again. And not only that, the next build finished in record time of 2 minutes and 44 seconds. Yes, it finished faster on the external than the internal by two times. So we did see great speed improvements in the external SSD for things like moving files, and our compilation times didn't suffer on the external drive. Even during real world test, the internal drive seemed to handle the builds with just small slowdowns. But when swapping hard to the external drive, that really brought our system down to its knees. Is this the kind of upgrade that's worth it? For isolated tasks, yes it is. It will speed up moving files significantly. It won't make your Xcode compilations faster, but it might make some builds faster, like we saw with the mono repo. That's moving files back and forth, a lot of files. Most development scenarios will be fine here on their own. The exceptions will be things like machine learning, game development, and maybe even mobile development where you might have multiple simulators open, especially Android emulators. But if you're relying heavily on multitasking and have a ton of programs open, watch out. Swapping to the external SSD might bring with it some undesired consequences. Should you upgrade from the base model to either get more RAM or more storage? Well, firstly, 256 gigabytes, uh, which comes on the base model, doesn't get you very far. I've just installed all my software development tools and I've already used just under 200 gigabytes of space. But the external drive can really help in that situation and you can upgrade that at will. The machine is going to cost you 600 bucks and then the sky's the limit when it comes to Thunderbolt 4 external drive. This enclosure costs around 100 bucks. This particular drive that I have in there is another 100 bucks so that's 200 dollars extra to get a terabyte. If you were to get a terabyte in just the Mac Mini then that would cost you a thousand dollars. An external drive also has the added benefit of being easily replaced if it dies on you unlike the internal SSD which you're stuck with. Also what you can't upgrade at all later is the RAM. So if there is one single upgrade you get the most benefit from, that would be the RAM. That's all for me today. If you did enjoy this video, I'd appreciate a like. Thank you very much for spending this uh, time with me. Yeah, more tests coming up. Thanks for watching. See you later.